I'm Steve Wiggins, and this is the Groundworks Ministries podcast. Today's chapter, Isaiah chapter 8, is a continuation of a prophecy that actually begins in chapter 7. And it doesn't end until the beginning of chapter 9. So to get the full effect of today's chapter, I think we're going to begin in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 1. Isaiah chapter 7, verse 1. It begins like this. Now it came to pass in the days of Ahaz, the son of Jotham, the son of Uzziah, king of Judah, that Rezin, the king of Syria, and Pekah, the son of Ramaliah, king of Israel, went up to Jerusalem to make war against it, but could not prevail against it. In the days of Ahaz, okay, well, who is Ahaz? Ahaz was a wicked king of Judah. Usually we're used to seeing wicked kings being in the northern kingdom of Israel. But this is a wicked king of Judah, which is kind of rare. He worshiped other gods, And he even sacrificed his son to Molech in the fire. Uh, The only good thing Ahaz seems to do is to father a kid named Hezekiah who becomes a good king. So Rezin, the king of Syria, and Pekah, the son of Remaliah, king of Israel, made war against Jerusalem, but the Bible says they could not prevail. Well, let's read about that. 2 Chronicles chapter 28, verse 6. For Pekah, the son of Remaliah, killed 120,000 in Judah in one day. Think about that. All valiant men, because they had forsaken the Lord their God of their fathers. So, despite the wickedness of Syria and the northern kingdom of Israel, collectively wicked, all of this happened to the southern king of Israel, not because Syria and Israel were strong, but because Judah had forsaken the Lord, who is their strength. Continuing, Isaiah chapter 7, verse 2. And it was told to the house of David, saying, Syria's forces are deployed in Ephraim. So his heart and the heart of all the people were moved as the trees of the woods are moved with the wind. (laughs) They were shaken by the wind. Matthew 11, verse 7. As they departed, Jesus began to say to the multitudes concerning John the Baptist, What did you go out in the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? No, this is a man of biblical conviction. So the people of Judah, under Ahaz's rule, an ungodly leader, were moved by fear instead of supported by conviction to God's word. And if you can't stand on God's word, you're never going to rightly perceive the situation that you're in or understand how the Lord wants you to respond to it. You'll be forever reasoning, that is, using and looking for human solutions to spiritual battles. Isaiah 7 verse 3 continues, Then the Lord said to Isaiah, Go out now to meet Ahaz, you and Shear Jeshub your son, at the end of the aqueduct from the upper pool on the highway to the fuller's field. She'er Jashub, your son. Now, Isaiah's son was a walking object lesson. Now, in Hebrew, the name of Isaiah's son means a remnant shall return. So God is saying, go out there with a remnant shall return. Also, it shows how the values of the father are imparted to the next generation. Imagine the conversations between Isaiah and his son as they journeyed to and fro uh, from the aqueduct, right? Okay, now your name is a remnant shall return. That's why I'm bringing you. You're going to become an object lesson, son. Why is that, dad? You see, that's how biblical values are imparted. And they're going to the fuller's field. It's right at the edge of the fuller's field. Now, the Fuller's Field. You know, the name of the clay mine near Hinnom, it translates as both the Fuller's Field and also it's known as the Potter's Field. And both of the Fuller's and the Potter's, their occupations have to do with clay mining. And pottery making, uh, they both deal with clay, mining clay and using clay to make pots. Fuller's earth to this very day is still a very common name for a type of clay. And we see the image later 
during Ahaz's son Hezekiah's reign. Let's go there for a moment. 2 Kings chapter 18, verse 17. Then the king of Assyria went to Tartan, the Rabsaris, and the Rabshekah from Lachish, with the great army against Jerusalem to King Hezekiah. And they went up, and they came to Jerusalem. And when they had come up, They went and they stood by the aqueduct from the upper pool, which is on the highway to the fuller's field. So, of course, the most notorious mention of this fuller's field, or also known as the potter's field, comes after Jesus' crucifixion. Matthew 27, verses 3 through 10. Then Judas, his betrayer, seeing that he had been condemned was remorseful, and he brought back the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and the elders, saying, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. And they said, What is that to us? You see to it. And then he threw down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed, and he went and hanged himself. But the chief priests took the silver pieces, and they said, It's not lawful to put them into the treasury because they are the price of blood. Interesting, they paid the price of blood, but then when it was given back, they're like so self-righteous. And so they consulted together, and they bought with them, with the silver pieces, the potter's field to bury strangers in. Therefore, that field has been called the field of blood to this day. And then was fulfilled what was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet, saying, And they took the thirty pieces of silver and the value of him who was priced, whom they of the children of Israel priced, and they gave them for the potter's field as the Lord directed me. So now we understand that what Isaiah is saying here is I want to make an object lesson that a remnant will return here. But just the idea that a remnant will return means that everybody is going to have to leave eventually. Let's continue in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 4. He says, beginning in verse 3, Then the Lord said to Isaiah, Go out now and meet Ahaz, you and Sheer Jeshub, a remnant shall return, your son, at the end of the aqueduct to the upper pool on the highway to the fuller's field and say to them, take heed and be quiet. Do not fear or be faint hearted for those two stubs of smoking firebrands for the fierce anger of Rezin and Syria and the son of Remaliah because Syria, Ephraim and the son of Remaliah have plotted evil against you. Don't be afraid of them because those guys are evil and they've plotted evil. Saying, let us go up against Judah and trouble it, and let us make a gap in its wall for ourselves and set a king over them, the son of Tabel. Thus says the Lord God, it shall not stand, nor shall it come to pass. For the head of Syria is Damascus, and the head of Damascus is Rezin. Within 65 years, Ephraim will be broken so that it will not even be a people. He says, it shall not stand, it shall not come to pass. Don't worry about it. Oh no, what are we going to do? Russia and China and Iran are coming together against us. He says, don't worry about it. In modern terms, it's not going to come to pass. They're not even going to be a people in another generation. If God says it, that's all there is to say. How are you going to do it? What's it going to look like? What should I do? God's silent. Just trust me. I got it. Let's continue again in verse 8, where he says, For the head of Syria is Damascus. The head of Damascus is resin. Within 65 years, Ephraim will be broken so that it will not even be a people, the northern kingdom of Israel. The head of Ephraim is Samaria, and the head of Samaria is Remaliah's son. And if you will not believe, surely you shall not be established. And that's the exhortation. Don't worry about Ephraim and Samaria. They're not even going to be a people. Syria and the northern kingdom of Israel, a.k.a. Ephraim and Samaria, they may be allies but not now, but Assyria is going to end up defeating the northern kingdom instead of uh, <clears throat> Judah. This is because of the northern kingdom's idolatry, which goes all the way to the top of their government. Now, America should be warned. The idolatry which goes all the way to the top of the government. 
He says, if you will not believe, you understand? There is both an invitation to grace and a warning against judgment, and the decision is in the hands of the people. I have not decided to make you believe, he doesn't say, if you will not believe, which means this, if you will believe, it'll go good. If you will not believe, ooh, it's a chilling warning because the temple is in Jerusalem. Doesn't mean that the Lord is going to spare Jerusalem's destruction. Let me say it again. Because the temple is in Jerusalem doesn't mean that the Lord will spare Jerusalem's destruction. You might go to the biggest church in town, but if he would allow the temple in Israel with the Ark of the Covenant and, the, and the, all the altars and, and, and the menorah and all that stuff, if he would allow that to be destroyed, believe me, he'd allow your mega church to come down. If the people from the top down depart from the word of the Lord, and he's already defined in the book of Isaiah that departing from the word of the Lord is to just do it, is to just partly follow the word of the Lord. Let's keep reading in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 10. I know we will get to chapter 8 soon. He says, Moreover, the Lord spoke again to Ahaz, saying, Ask for a sign for yourself from the Lord your God, and ask it neither in the depth or in the height above. But Ahaz said, I will not ask, nor will I test the Lord. God says, ask me for a sign. He's like, I'm not going to ask you. I'm not going to test you. you. This sounds like a very spiritual answer from Ahaz, right? I mean, he almost seems to say what Jesus said in Matthew 4, verse 7, that you shall not tempt the Lord your God. And though the words are similar and the hearts are far apart, the Lord commanded for Ahaz to ask for a sign. God says, ask me for a sign. He's like, I'm not going to ask you for a sign. And yet Ahaz refused to ask for a sign. That's rebellion. It's because when God fulfilled the sign, Ahaz knew that he would be obligated, number one, to believe it, and number two, to repent. I don't want to have to be obligated to God when he gives me a sign that it's going to go this way because it means I'm going to have to repent. <laughs> And he makes it sound so holy. I'm never going to tempt the Lord by asking for a sign. God's like, I told you to ask me for a sign. And that's why God gets angry in verse 13. He says, okay, well, since you didn't ask for a gracious sign, I'm going to give you the sign of judgment. Isaiah chapter 7, verse 13. Then he said, Here now, O house of David, is it a small thing for you to weary men? But will you weary my God also? You think it's a small thing to weary men, but now you're going to weary the Lord? The rulers of Judah may have treated other people poorly, but now they've treated the Lord even more poorly. Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. He didn't, it's not the one you asked. You could ask for a good one. He's going to give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. The virgin's going to conceive and bear a son. Many commentators think that this was immediately fulfilled when a young woman in the royal household who had been married only a short time conceived and bore a son. And then she unknowingly named him Emmanuel. They go on to say that before this boy came to eat solid food, Israel and Syria would be defeated. You see, those who deny the actual virgin birth, which was only associated with the birth of Jesus, they like to point out that the Hebrew word Alma, which translates as virgin, can also be translated as young woman. And here's their point, to deny the virgin birth. Their point is this, Isaiah is simply saying that a young woman is going to give birth and she won't have to be a virgin. And while the near fulfillment of this prophecy may reference a young woman who gave birth, the far or the ultimate fulfillment, what this prophecy is really speaking about, clearly points to a woman who miraculously conceives and gives birth. And this is especially clear because the Old Testament never uses that word Alma in a context other than to describe a virgin. And we know this passage ultimately speaks of Jesus because the Holy Spirit says so. 
as he spoke through the apostle Matthew. Matthew chapter 1, verse 23, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, that they shall call his name Emmanuel, which translates God with us. We also know this passage speaks of Jesus because the prophecy is addressed not only to Ahaz, but also to the entire house of David. He says, O house of David. Let's continue. Isaiah chapter 7, verse 15. He says, Curds and honey he will eat, that he may know to refuse the evil and choose the good. For before the child shall know to refuse evil and choose the good, the land that you dread will be forsaken by both her kings. The Lord will bring the king of Assyria upon you and your people and your father's house, days that have not come since the day that Ephraim departed from Judah. And it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord will whistle for the fly that is in the farthest parts of the rivers of Egypt and for the bee that is in the land of Assyria. So it's flies coming from the south and bees coming from the north. And they will come, and all of them will rest in the desolate valleys and in the clefts of the rocks, and on all thorns and in all pastures. In the same day the Lord will shave the hired, uh, with a hired razor, uh, that is not from within Israel, uh, with those from beyond the river, with the king of Assyria, the head and the hair of the leg. So, so he's going to use the king of Assyria as a razor, and he's going to shave your head, and he's going to shave your legs. Going to take away your masculinity. And he will also remove the beard. And it shall be in that day that the man will keep alive a young cow and two sheep. So it shall be from the abundance of milk that they give that he will eat curds. For curds and honey, everyone will eat who is left in the land. Okay, let's break it down. Curds and honey, a.k.a. milk and honey. It's actually food of humility, right? Milk and honey, it's just something the poor people can eat. You can find honey in the woods if you find a beehive. And if you have a a goat or you have cows, you got milk and you got honey. It's food of humility as opposed to the luxurious food of kings. And it also describes the humble nature of the Messiah. Now, continue reading here in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 23. And it shall happen in that day that wherever there could be a thousand vines worth a thousand shekels of silver, it would be for briars and thorns. With arrows and bows, men will come there, because all of the land will become briars and thorns. And to any hill which could be dug with a hoe, you will not go there for fear of briars and thorns. But it will become a range for oxen and a place for the sheep to roam. Instead of vines pulling out, you know, fruit from the earth instead of grapes coming so you can have wine and you can have blessing and prosperity. It'll be nothing but thorns and wasteland. The absence of fruit is a sign that the people have abandoned the Lord and no longer receive his blessing. Oh, it's fertile land. You just can't grow anything on it. And now we can start to understand the images now that we're rolling into chapter 8. Chapter 8, verse 1, Moreover, the Lord said to me, Take a large scroll and write on it with a man's pen concerning uh, Macher Shalah Hashbaz. Okay? Take a large scroll and write on it Macher Shalal Hashbaz. Now, if Isaiah were preaching today, we would say that he took out a front page ad in a newspaper. And the purpose was to announce the birth of his newest son. Remember, his first son, a remnant shall return. His second son is going to be named Fast Picking Easy Prey. First kid, a remnant shall return. Second kid, Fast Picking Easy Prey. 
Let's continue in verse 2 of Isaiah. And I will take for myself faithful witnesses to record Uriah the priest and Zechariah the son of uh, Jeberechiah. And then I went to the prophetess, and she conceived and bore a son. And then the Lord said, Call his name Maher Shalal Hashbaz, the prophetess, the wife of Isaiah, the prophet. She's known as the prophetess. It may be that she also prophesied, as did Miriam, who was Moses' sister, Deborah in the days of the judges, and also Huldah in the days of Josiah, women who also prophesied. Isaiah chapter 8, verse 4, continues like this. <clears throat> well, verse 3, Then I went to the prophetess, Isaiah, I went to my wife, and she conce uh, conceived and bore a son, and the Lord said to me, Call his name Maher Shalal Hashbaz, for before the child shall have knowledge to cry out, My father and my mother, the riches of Damascus and the spoil of Syria will be taken away by the king of Assyria. Before he cries out, Father or mother. Now we have already met Isaiah's first son, as I said, She'er Jeshub, a remnant returns. But what do we think about son number two? His name implies that Ahaz's enemies will be plundered, but that Judah also was, was vulnerable and would suffer. Before the boy could say Abba or Ima in Hebrew, father or mother, Assyria will defeat both Syria and the northern kingdom of Israel. So basically, within two years, number one, Judah's present enemies Syria and the northern kingdom of Israel will disappear. Well, that's a relief. But also, a greater en enemy will emerge in the nation of Assyria. So Syria and the northern kingdom of Israel get what they deserve. But now a greater enemy, the one who consumed Syria and the northern kingdom, a greater enemy will emerge. Why is this? Because the leaders and thus the people of Judah would not humble themselves in order to seek and to heed God's word. That would have staved off God's judgment. Isaiah chapter 7 verse 9, If you will not believe, surely you shall not be established. Let's continue reading in Isaiah chapter 8 verse 5. The Lord also spoke to me again, saying, Inasmuch as these people refuse the waters of Shiloh that flow softly and rejoice in Rezin and in Remaliah's son, now therefore, behold, the Lord brings up over them the waters of the river, strong and mighty, the king of Assyria in all of his glory. He will go up and over all his channels and go over all his banks." The waters of Siloam versus the waters of the Euphrates River. So the sons of Isaiah, a remnant shall return, and fast picking, easy prey, are no longer the focus of the prophecy. Now God is using rivers that are well known to anyone living in Jerusalem. The pool of Siloam, a.k.a. Shiloh, comes from the Gihom Spring and is Jerusalem's natural water source. In the New Testament book of John, chapter 9, we see healing taking place there. And now we find a deeper reason for its New Testament imagery. Siloam means peace, just like the word shalom. And it speaks of God's care and his protection. The word Euphrates, which flows through Assyria, means flooding. So flooding along the Euphrates River was common. And it was also devastating to both crops and anything in its path. And because Judah refused the quiet peace, Siloam, of God's provision in favor of chasing after the flashy worship of Assyrian false gods, well, then the Lord is going to send a flash flood of judgment. You could have had the pool of Siloam, but now you're going to have a flash flood. A tsunami, as it were, is going to roll through the land. Isaiah chapter 8, verse 8. He says, He will pass, speaking of the king of Assyria, <clears throat> He will pass through Judah 
and he will overflow and pass over, and he will reach up to the neck, and the stretching out of his wings will fill the breadth of your land, O Emmanuel. He will pass over. Now, think of the Passover, because this is word, word play with the image of the Egyptian Passover. Remember, when God is with his people, Emmanuel, and they are protected. But when they abandon him, he's not with them, is he? They lose his protection, <clears throat> and therefore they become victims. So, instead of having their sin passed over while he judges the sin of others, now what will happen is these floodwaters will pass over um, their protective barriers and will judge them all because they rejected the Lord. And it will come up to the neck. So the Lord was using the image of the Euphrates to tell Judah how Assyria is not only going to conquer their enemies in the north, but they'll also try to strangle Judah. They'll get all the way up to the neck. And were it not for the Lord's presence, Emmanuel, God with us, were the Lord not with us, there would be no hope at all. Notice that he says that, that this uh, king of Assyria is going to come over like a flood and he's going to spread out his wings. You think about how a flood spreads once, once it goes beyond the levee. <clears throat> As a bird of prey, Assyria is going to swoop down upon Judah. One day my daughter Olivia was sitting out in the back of our house and she's reading a book. And she said, and she had a little bun on the top of her head. It was just like, you know, she just kind of tied up her hair like that. And then out of nowhere, a cooper's hawk came flying down. And if you've ever seen one, their wingspan is like five feet wide, you know, when they come down. And it's a silent killer because you don't hear it. And all of a sudden, out of the corner of her eyes, she sees this thing and she screams. And this thing uh, lifts up and then it sits on top of this uh, little awning that we had in the house. And she looked at this massive bird, didn't even see it coming. That's the way that Assyria is predicted. And we all look back later and think, I think that that little bun that you put on the top of your head, he must have thought was a mouse on your head and he was just going to swoop down and take it for himself. <laughs> so you got a bird of prey coming down with these massive wings. But contrast that to the mother hen. It's an imagery that Jesus used for himself. The enemy comes in like a bird of prey. Jesus says, I'm like a mother hen. Matthew 23, verse 27, he says, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. Well, that's who Isaiah is prophesying against. The one who kills the prophets and stones those who were sent to her. Jesus said, How often I have wanted to gather your children together. As a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. But you were not willing. Once again, you have a choice in the matter. Just as Judah forsook the pool of peace and they got the flood water of judgment, they also got the bird of prey when they could have had the mother hen. He says, O oh, Emmanuel, you know, in the midst of its darkest moment, Judah is reminded of the most important truth God is with us. It's a plea. God remembers that we are yours. God, remember us. We are yours. A nation has gone astray, and yet a baby bears the testimony that we are not forgotten. The Messiah is our only hope. Sometimes God will let you walk through the valley of, the, of, of death, of your own choosing, just to teach you to trust in his word. Turn to him, for he promises to never leave or to forsake you. You know, even in his rebuke, God still loves us. As Isaiah says, the name Emmanuel, he seems to be immediately strengthened. Let's continue in Isaiah chapter 8, verse 9. He says, Be shattered, O you peoples, and be broken in pieces. He says, give ear, all of you from far countries. Gird yourselves, but be broken in pieces. Gird yourselves, but be broken in pieces. Take counsel together, but it will come to nothing. Speak the word, but it will not stand, for God is with us. Speak the word, but it won't stand. I look at Israel 
always in the Middle East war. Speak the word. They conspire against Israel, but you watch how the Lord protects them. Even in their sin, the Lord protects them. He always leaves a remnant. It's a mystery, but God uses non-believers as tools of righteous judgment toward his people's sin. And yet he also sets limits to that judgment. See also Job. And see also the temptation of Jesus. God remembers his promise and his presence is our source of power. Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20. It's been up here for a moment. He says, And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them. I mean, soak them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. Isaiah chapter 8, verse 11 continues like this. For the Lord spoke thus to me with a strong hand and instructed me that I should not walk in the way of this people. The Lord spoke to me. It's amazing how the Lord speaks to people who seek him. It's amazing how he's available to people that don't seek him, and yet they never avail themselves to him. Even Isaiah had to be reminded to not get caught up in worldly counsel and the values of this world. Even preachers have to be continually reminded of God's holiness from his word. You know, the best of men are merely men at their best. Let me say that again. The best of men are merely men at their best. And we have to seek God's word daily, all of us. Here we find God's call to consecration that is to be set apart for his work. We continue in Isaiah chapter 8, verse 12. He says, Do not say a conspiracy concerning all that this people call a conspiracy by their definition, nor be afraid of their threats, nor be troubled. The Lord of hosts, him you shall hallow, make him holy. Let him be your fear, and let him be your dread. Hey, if you're going to fear something, how about you fear the Lord? Remember God's power, and be strengthened by that. You want him on your side. Chapter 8, verse 14, he continues, He will be as a sanctuary but a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense to both houses of Israel as a trap and as a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. He shall be a sanctuary. You know, a sanctuary is not a building. A sanctuary is Jesus himself. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 through 6. Coming to him as a living stone, rejected indeed, by men, but chosen by God and precious, you also, as living stones, are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Therefore, it's also contained in Scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he who believes on him will by no means be put to shame." Therefore, to you who believe, remember this isn't for unbelievers, he's precious, but to those who are disobedient, the stone which the builders rejected, that is, those who thought that they were the, you know, we're running the show in the church here, the stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. Why do they stumble? They stumble being disobedient to the word to which they were appointed. So we know that Jesus is the stone of stumbling, that Jesus is the rock of offense that is being spoken of. And this is a strong argument for the deity of Jesus because clearly in Isaiah chapter 8, verses 18 and 14, I'm sorry, verses 13 and 14 of chapter 8, the Lord of hosts is the stone. So now when we realize that Jesus is the stone, now we understand the deity of Jesus. Clearly in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 6 through 8, 
Jesus Christ is the stone. Why? How can it be? God the Father is the stone and Jesus Christ, because the two are one. Look at what Jesus said in John chapter 10, verses 27 through 33. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. (laughs) Right? Because before the people can say, what is it, Jesus? Is it your hand or is it the Father's hand? The Father and I are one. And And then the Jews took up stones to stone him again. And Jesus answered, Many good works I've shown you from my Father. For which of those works do you stone me? And the Jews answered, saying, For a good work we do not stone you, but for blasphemy. And because you, being a man, make yourself God. Let's continue reading in Isaiah chapter 8, verse 15. He says, Many among them shall stumble, and they shall fall and be broken, Be snared and taken. Bind up the testimony. Seal the law among my disciples. Interesting what he says. Bind up the testimony. Seal the law among my disciples. John 1 verse 12. Who are the disciples? But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name. He says this, hey, listen, if they're not believers, they're never going to get this. But it's sealed up for those who believe, who seek my word, and they understand the truth. Let's continue in verse 17. Well, verse 16, bind up the testimony, seal the law among my disciples. Only the people who love the Lord and who seek the Lord will understand what's going on. And I will wait on the Lord, who hides his face from the house of Jacob, and I will hope in him. Here I am, and the children whom the Lord has given me. We are for signs and wonders in Israel, from the Lord of hosts, who dwells in Mount Zion." Here I am with those whom you have given to me. I'm not the only believer here. There's others who are believers. And we are for signs and wonders. It's the purpose of our being, of our existence. Waiting and trusting, he says in verse 18. You know, Isaiah is also waiting and trusting. He says, here I am with the children you have entrusted me. Hebrews chapter 2, verses 11 through 16. For both he who sanctifies and those who are being sanctified are all of one, for which reason he is not ashamed to call them brothers, saying, here I am and the children whom God has given to me. There was a remnant who believed. John 17, verse 12, says this. Jesus speaking to the Father as he's praying before the Garden of Gethsemane, before his uh, trial, before the cross. Jesus prays this. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in your name. And those whom you gave me, I have kept. And none of them is lost except the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. Judas was the one who who was buried in the potter's field, if you remember. James chapter 1, verses 2 through 8. My brothers, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. And if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, and he's tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all of his ways. So this is speaking now to a remnant, 
those who believe, and they are with me. They have received the word, they are living according to the word, and they are for signs and wonders. And what are those signs and wonders? Well, number one, the word of God is true, the word of God works, and look how we are blessed by the Lord even in the midst of his judgment. Let's continue reading in Isaiah chapter 8, verse 19. And when they say to you, Seek those who are mediums and wizards, who whisper and who mutter, should not a people seek their God? Should they seek the dead on behalf of the living? Verse 20, to the law and to the testimony, get to the word of God, get to the Bible. If they do not speak according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. There's no light in them. This is a commitment to why are you going and playing tarot cards? Why are you going to some fortune teller? Why are you trying to wake up the dead and conjure the dead to try to figure out the future? Get to the Bible. John chapter 1, verses 1 through 11. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and all things were made through him. You want to understand the world and how it all works? Get to the one who made it. He says, and without him, nothing was made that was made. There's not one thing where Jesus is like, yeah, no, I didn't make that when it comes to the elements and the way life goes. In him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shines in the darkness. And the darkness did not comprehend it. That Hebrew word means overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John, and this man came for a witness, to bear witness of the light, that's who we are, to be signs and wonders, that all through him might believe. And he was not that light, but he was sent to bear witness of that light, that was the true light, which gives light to every man, speaking of Jesus, coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, the Jewish people, and his own did not receive him. Let's continue reading in Isaiah chapter 8, verse 21. Starting in verse 20, to the law and to the testimony, get back to the Bible, to the original. He says, if they do not speak according to this world, it is because, uh, to this word, there is because there's no light in them, speaking of the preachers. There's a lot of preachers who say, you know what, it's okay if a man wants to marry a man and a woman wants to marry, because God is love and God is a... Hey, that's, that's a lie. Don't listen to them. There is no light in anybody who says that. There is no light. You understand what that means? They're not believers. Oh, no, they're pastors of big churches, and they sell a lot of books, and they, have, they might have all those things, but it's all worldly. Get to the Word, is what he's saying. Get to the Word. My pastor says abortion is okay because God wants you to be happy. Oh, yeah, well, there's no light in that, pastor. Get to the word. If they will pass through it, hard-pressed and hungry, and it shall happen. And sorry, they will pass through it, hard-pressed and hungry, and it shall happen when they are hungry, that they will be enraged and they will curse their king and their God and look upward. And then they will look to the earth and see trouble and darkness and gloom of anguish, and they will be driven into darkness. I mean, if you, I've already quoted it already, Psalm chapter 1, Blessed is he who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, there's your progression, nor sits in the seat of the mocker or the scornful, mocking and scorning people that believe in the Bible. They don't have, they're not like trees planted by rivers of water bearing fruit in season. No, they're like dried up trees. They're not living in the light of the presence of the Lord. They're living in total darkness. Now contrast the light of the world with the darkness of being cast out. Matthew 7 verses 21 through 23 Jesus said, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. Slip service. It's not heart surrender. But he who does the will of my Father. Why? Because they got to this word and they walked according to it. 
Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name and cast out demons in your name? We thought we did. We did many wonders in your name, and then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. You practice religion, but you do it without the Bible. Matthew chapter 8, verses 11 and 12, I say to you that many will come from the east and the west, Gentiles, and they will take their places at the feast with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, the, the patriarchs of Israel in the kingdom of heaven, but the subjects of the kingdom, those who are Jewish through heritage but not through faith, those who do not believe and are saved by grace through faith in the Messiah. But the subjects of the kingdom will be thrown outside into the darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And so now here you have a choice. Same choice that Isaiah is bringing. You want the light or you want the darkness? Do you want blessing or do you want cursing? Do you want life or do you want death? What do you choose? God's already chosen to die for you, to pay the penalty for your sin, and to offer to you, uh, to reveal that truth to you through the Holy Spirit, and now to offer to you salvation. But what do you choose? Do you want to experience the salvation of the Lord? Because you can be forgiven. The forgiveness has already been paid for. You can be washed from within. You can begin operating with the power of God's presence, the Holy Spirit in your life. And I can lead you in a prayer where you could talk to God yourself. And in that prayer, you can confess your sin and you can profess your faith in Jesus, that he died on the cross for your sin and that he rose from the grave, having defeated sin and death and that he's alive today, offering salvation from a certain coming judgment, if you would believe it and receive it. You can know for certain that you will go to heaven when you die. The Bible says, for it is written that we may know that we have eternal life. You can know for certain that the Holy Spirit will immediately rush into your life and begin guiding you as you seek his word, the Bible. But you have to want it. I'll lead you in that prayer now. Lord, I know that I'm a sinner and I can't save myself. But I believe Jesus, God made flesh, has paid the penalty for my sin on the cross. I believe that he has risen from the dead. He has defeated death and sin. And he offers to me the forgiveness of my sin that he purchased on the cross. If I would believe and I would surrender to receive it. So Lord, I surrender to you now. Come into my life. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Lord, take control of my life and begin to teach me from your word how to live a life of thankfulness and purpose which you created for me. Thank you, Lord, for saving me. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> if you prayed that prayer and you meant it, I'd love to hear from you. If you're watching on YouTube or Vimeo or if you're on Real Life Network, you can send a message there in the comments section. Or you can go to our website, groundworksministries.com, and say, hey, I just prayed to receive the Lord. Now where do we go from here? And we'll reach out to you. I'm Steve Wiggins, and this is the Groundworks Ministries podcast. Now, Groundworks Ministries operates entirely through financial donations from faithful people like you. And yes, we do need your monthly support to continue operating. Donating is secure, and it's easy at our website, groundworksministries.com. You know, another way to help is just tell people about us. Tell them about Groundworks Ministries. Share these podcasts with friends and family and on your social media. And of course, you can always direct folks to our website, groundworksministries.com. <laughs>